Okay, for those of you that have been watching on YouTube, continuing our study in the book of Acts, we're in Acts chapter 2 yet, and um, anyway, uh, we've been slowly going through it, but uh, like I've said before, uh, this is one of the most important passages that you can ever study and know exactly what's going on is in the first few chapters of Acts. Now, obviously, to really study the scriptures and know the word rightly divided or uh, dispensationally, you need to understand the entire book of Acts, that most of it is a transitional period from the time of the dispensation of law into the dispensation of grace. So we will see in the book of Acts as we go through, <clears throat> and I don't, we're not going to go verse by verse through the whole book, but uh, we will, we will uh, give some brief messages on the rest of the book of Acts when we get through this first part here. But in understanding the first couple of chapters of the book of Acts will open up your eyes to all the rest of the scriptures. And uh, so we want to just point that out again. Um, there's the biggest, like Anderson says, the biggest blunder of the church is not recognizing that the body of Christ did not start in Acts chapter 2. Now, uh, those on YouTube, don't shut it off right away. We've got to look at the scriptures and see what it says. Uh, what, did, what do the scriptures teach concerning the church, the body of Christ, the church, uh, the believing remnant of Jews, uh, the church what, which was beginning to form here at Pentecost, which did form there, and so forth? What is, what is the difference? So, um, <clears throat> in verse 36, which I read a little bit ago of the of chapter 2 there, at the end of Peter's first sermon, he says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, we're going to deal with that particular phrase. Notice I have it in, in yellow up there. Uh, whom you have crucified. And... That's kind of a theme of uh, Peter's sermon, first sermon, what they have done to the Lord Jesus Christ. They have rejected him. And, of course, he's mainly speaking to the rulers of Jerusalem at this particular time, that they have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, whom you have crucified. Uh, Peter uh, refers to the cross of Calvary, really, with the nation of Israel as a shame. It was a shame that they have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. We do not see Peter talking about the benefits of the cross in light of salvation as far as the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ providing a position in the heavenlies for the body of Christ and so forth. And why do we not see that? Because Peter knew nothing about it. Peter did not know anything about uh, the body of Christ, which we are part of today, uh, the dispensation of grace, uh, the relationship between Jew and Gentile, as far as Peter knew, the Jews were God's favored people, and the Gentiles were uh, way far off and outside of the commonwealth of Israel, as, as uh, he wrote in Ephesians chapter 2. They had, uh, there was no relationship whatsoever, and a lot of times the Jews would call the Gentiles, they're nothing but dogs. And believe it or not, the Lord Jesus Christ even called the Gentile a dog, uh, referred to as a dog. So we, uh, we question some of these things, but there's a reason for that. And the reason we have in Acts chapter, uh, first few chapters of Acts here, is that God is still dealing, ministering to the nation of Israel. No Gentiles, uh, no body of Christ, none of these truths are, have been made known yet, which we're going to see as we go on here. Okay, verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts, said unto Peter, to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Uh, there were many there that heard Peter's sermon, and uh, boy, when Peter said, You have cru crucified the Lord of glory, uh, they, the Holy Spirit was kind of working on them, and they would, well, okay, Peter, what do we do then? And he said, Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for what? For the remission of sins. 
or for their salvation, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, <clears throat> many times we see, uh, or I should say even most of the time, we see now even our, our Protestant churches or different denominations, uh, they begin the, the church, the body of Christ, in Acts chapter 2. And uh, we're going to deal with that more as we go on here. But uh, it's interesting to know what Peter says here. First of all, he says, repent. Well, repent in the scriptures means to have a change of mind. Uh, you have a change of mind about something. Well, what do they need to have a change of mind about? Well, about the Lord Jesus Christ. They have rejected him. He just said it. They crucified the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, which the Lord Jesus came as their Messiah to set up the kingdom, the thousand-year reign, dealing with, with the, the, the nation of Israel. And, of course, the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, should take the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ then to all the nations, to the Gentiles. But we see that that did not happen because they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. So repent. Now, we do not see, when we get into Paul's epistles uh, later on, or the, as Paul comes on the scene, he writes several epistles, and uh, he never really tells or commands anyone to repent of what they have done. Why? Well, we're going to deal with that as we go on here, but uh, we don't see it really in Paul's epistles in connection with salvation. Uh, and it says, be baptized. Well, be baptized. And we, of course, here there's a lot of different baptisms in the scripture. In fact, we have a sheet on the back table there. If you look at one of that, there's 12 different baptisms in scripture. So which one is it here? Well, we know if we look at the, uh, the context here and just coming out of the Gospels and so forth, that it is water baptism, which we look and see as water baptism, uh, being baptized with water. So Peter is saying, hey, this is what you need to do. You need to have a change of mind about the Lord Jesus Christ, and then you need to be water baptized. Why? For the remission of sins, for the salva your salvation. So your sins may be taken care of. And if you do that, then ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Notice the order there. Repent, be water baptized, then you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that's what Peter says. Uh... Remember, at this particular time here, I'm going to quickly go back to uh, verse 4 and 5 of that, Acts chapter 1, because it says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them, this is the Lord Jesus, they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. Well, what was the promise of the Father? It was the giving of the Holy Spirit. Which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days from now. Now, I'm going to go to Paul's epistles here real quick here, just to show the contrast in the different messages here. First we had John the Baptist baptizing with water, okay? And then when the Lord Jesus Christ comes on the scene, of course, he preaches the same thing, the kingdom, which is called the kingdom message. And then we get into uh, the promise of the Father, which the Lord Jesus said that you will receive and uh, at Pentecost, which they did. Well, now we have another baptism in 1 Corinthians 12, 13 that Paul writes about. He says, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether there be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, have all been made to drink into one spirit. And boy, that, that is really a contrast to what we've already seen as far as the message to the Jews were concerned about repent and be water baptized and then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, that's not what Paul's saying here. Now, I'm just going to back up a little bit. When Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, for your salvation, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So they had to have a change of mind, they had to be water baptized, and if they did those things, then they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, 
what is the gift of the Holy Spirit? Well, we see it's, it's the giving of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but notice, going back to verse 4 and 5 of chapter 1, it says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which was the giving of the Holy Spirit, which John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Okay, so we got a contrast here. John baptized with water, but at Pentecost, uh, the Father, the Lord says, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Okay, John baptized with what? Water. But you're going to be baptized with what? The Holy Ghost. There is a difference. Not many days from hence. So because that was about approximately 10 days because this is when the Lord was speaking to the uh, 11 just prior to his ascension, which was 40 days after uh, the resurrection and uh, about another 10 days which was Pente, Pentecost meaning 50 was uh, the Feast of Pentecost and that's when they were going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit so we have John baptizing with the water and then in Pentecost we have the Father baptizing with the Holy Spirit and then we get to Paul's epistles and we have who's doing the baptizing here? We have a different one. Now we have the Holy Spirit doing the baptizing. Well, what's he doing baptizing with what or what? It says, baptize the Holy Spirit. We're all baptized into one body. It's placing us, when we believe, into the body of Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Baptizes us into the body of Christ. So now we've got three different baptisms here, just off the, in, in Acts chapter here and in Paul's epistles. But it's very important to understand the difference between those. We have John baptizing with water. We, at Pentecost, we have God the Father baptizing with the Holy Spirit. And we get into Paul's epistles. Now we have the Holy Spirit baptizing us into the body of Christ. So there's a lot of difference between Acts chapter 2 and uh, 1 Corinthians 12. We have the Apostle Paul. Big difference. And that is, uh, we need to recognize that. Now, when Peter is preaching at Pentecost, he's always addressing Israel. Why? Because that God is still working with the nation of Israel. There's no Gentiles there at, uh, at Pentecost. And if there were some, you could say a Gentile would be a proselyte, would be a Gentile which, who became a Jew, which the Jews re, re, uh, uh, figured as another Jew if they had been a Gentile and now become a proselyte. So it was entirely made up of Jews at Pentecost. It was a Jewish feast day. Pentecost is a Jewish feast day. That was established way back in the book of, Levit of Leviticus. So God is working. You need to understand God is still working with the nation of Israel at this particular time. So Peter addresses these people at Jerusalem, Acts 2.14. He says, you men of Judea. Is that not Israel? Yes, it is. Acts 2.22, he says, Ye men of Israel, again. Acts 2.30, all the house of Israel. Acts 3.12, ye men of Israel. Never once does he mention a Gentile. We need to recognize what is happening at Pentecost, the first few chapters of Acts, is God still working with the nation of Israel. And if they did believe, did repent and believe, especially the rulers of the nation of Israel, we get into Acts chapter 3, we're going to find out what would have happened if they would have received the Lord Jesus Christ and believed that he was their Messiah. Verse 39, 41, it says, For the promise is unto you and, you, and, and to your children. This is the giving of the Holy Spirit. And to all that are far off, well, who's all that are far off? They are the Jews. That's not Gentiles. I've seen many books written about this, and they say, oh, an altar that are far off, that's all the Gentiles. No, it isn't. Jews are all over the, all over the known world at that particular time. They were dispersed way back from uh, uh, <clears throat> after the captivity. Uh, there were a few Jews that went back to Jerusalem, but primarily most of them spread out through all, all the known world at that time. 
And so it's been many, many years that uh, Jewish people have been scattered all over and they've become acclimated to the different parts of the world at that particular time. They learned different languages. By the way, why do you think there was a speaking in tongues? Because we had all kinds of Jewish people in Jerusalem that had now been under different languages. There were all kinds of different languages. So, in order to carry out the Great Commission, which the Apostle, which uh, the Lord Jesus Christ already commanded the Twelve, and those that follow them, was to go into all the world and preach the Gospel. Well, wouldn't it be a lot easier if you knew the languages? And that's exactly was the basis of speaking in tongues. Tongues being another language. They could carry out the Great Commission. And because, as far as Peter knew, the kingdom was about to be set up. Because the Lord Jesus Christ said that uh, he, would, he would come back and set up the kingdom, the thousand year reign. Okay, so, the promises unto you and your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Uh, <clears throat> that particular statement is interesting because... A lot of times when we see things happening in Scripture, if you read, if you read all the words, a lot of times it is the Lord who's doing the work. He is behind everything. And uh, as you see here, even as many are, as the Lord our God shall call. Well, if there's some that he calls, obviously there's some that he doesn't call, right? So we'll get into that later. And with many other words, did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward or crooked generation, which it really was at that particular time, uh, the nation of Israel. Then they gladly received his word and were baptized. Water baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So, they repented of what they have, how they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. Now they were water baptized, and as soon as that took place, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They could speak with other tongues. Uh, they could do miracles and so forth uh, because they were, they had received the Holy Spirit. Now, don't get it mixed up. That the Holy Spirit is not indwelling them necessarily, but they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So for what reason? That they'd have power to speak in tongues. They'd have power to perform miracles. And the performance of miracles was the really the basis of the Lord Jesus Christ. His ministry was performing miracles uh, so that the nation of Israel, the Jews, would believe that he was God. <clears throat> okay, with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, water baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So, wow. Wouldn't we like to see about 3,000 souls save some Sunday here? That would be great. <laughs> We'd have to buy more chairs. But anyway, so the Holy Spirit was really working here uh, with these people, and uh, 3,000 souls were added, or people were added. So the church is growing immensely here. Now, when I say the church, we're going to get that in just a second. When I say the church, I'm, not, I'm talking about this kingdom church or Jewish church that it began at Pentecost here. And uh, anyway, they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, breaking of bread and in prayers and fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles proving that the Lord is who he said he was and now that they have the Holy Spirit to, provide, to perform these wonders and signs that many other Jewish peoples might believe that Jesus Christ was their Messiah and all that believed were together and all had things in common they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need if the church, the body of Christ, began in Acts chapter 2, then uh, how many of you have sold everything that you have? Put it in a common kitty, and then we just dish it out to each one had need. Well, it, it's kind of funny because those that believe that those, the church started in Acts chapter 2, uh, they don't talk about this. 
or not necessarily about speaking in tongues, although we do have some denominations that believe in the speaking of tongues. Why? Because they just think that's the body of Christ. The church started in Acts chapter 2. It was a church that started there, but it was not the body of Christ, the church that we are members of. They continued daily in one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, or eating uh, house to house, to eat their, their meat or their food with gladness, singleness of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people. Wow. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Uh, wouldn't that be nice if that's the way we were today? <laughs> uh, praising God. Uh, going from house to house. I could go for that. Different meals at each house. <laughs> Breaking bread. Uh, praising God. Having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And we'll deal with that statement a little later. But I want to deal a little bit about church because there's so much confusion because this is one of the reasons why the church, the body of Christ, that some denominations, some people believe that that's where the church started. Well, they're, they're right. A church started there. It was a beginning of a church, but it had nothing to do with the body of Christ, which we are members of today. That truth never even came, became known until the Apostle Paul comes on the scene, that other apostle, which the Lord Jesus Christ... Um, um, gave to us, gave to the world, uh, the gospel of the Lord, the, 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 I'm sorry, the gospel of the grace of God, and uh, <clears throat> the truth about the body of Christ. So the word church, the actual Greek word for the word church is ekklesia. And the real meaning of it is a called out assembly. That's all it means, a called out assembly. It does not mean the building, which we are, even though we use that and even the scriptures sometimes use that uh, word church for the building, the, the meeting place. However, really the meaning behind that is the assembly that's in that building. That is the real church. Um, so it's a, it's a called out assembly. But there's something interesting there. Just because you see the word church, it does not mean the body of Christ necessarily. It can mean the church uh, in the wilderness which Paul points out, there was a church in the wilderness. Well, that's speaking of the nation of Israel way back in the 40 years of wandering in the desert. There was a church in the wilderness. There was a small assembly of believers at that particular time. And that's, that was called, like if you go to the uh, uh, Septuagint, you find that it's the Greek word ekklesia, the same word here, called out a church. It was a church, just a called out assembly. So, remember, the word church does not necessarily mean the body of Christ. It can mean any, uh, <clears throat> well, it's, it's, the word church would be a, a body of assembly of believers. However, the real true meaning of, of ecclesia is just a called out assembly. It doesn't have to be a group of believers. And a prime example of that is in Acts chapter 19, verse 32. And let's see, I don't think I have it here. On the screen, but uh, if you have your Bibles in Acts chapter 19, verse 32, or I can just tell you there, uh, Acts 19, 32 is at Ephesus when the believers there got tied up and they were worshiping the goddess Diana, uh, of course, which is a goddess which is uh, behind the working of Satan. But that particular group, that that assembly that was worshiping um, the goddess Diana is called a what in the Acts 19.32? It's called an assembly. I think if you have the King James Bible, it's called an assembly. Well, that word assembly is translated from the word ecclesia. That's what ecclesia means, an assembly. But what was that assembly made up of? Unbelieving, unbelieving people that were involved worshiping the goddess Diana. Uh, so <clears throat> just keep that in mind. There are several churches in the scriptures. Just to prove that, in Paul's epistles, he wrote in Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, he says, and he is the head, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, is the head of the body, the body of Christ, the church. So the body of Christ is called the church, or a church, who is the beginning, speaking of Christ, 
the firstborn from the dead, his resurrection, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So he is above all and for all, for all eternity. He has, have, has the preeminence. Go on in Colossians, it says, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. This is Apostle Paul. And, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body spake. In reference to the afflictions that Christ went through when he was on the earth as well as his own behind the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. That's why the Apostle Paul suffered so immensely in his missionary journeys because he was representing and telling about the body of Christ, which is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, which we are also members of today. He goes on, he says, Wherefore I am made a minister, where according to the dispensation of God, remember there's a lot of different dispensations in the scriptures. Paul uses that word, I think, four times, uh, the word dispensation. And uh, <clears throat> it's a time of God dispensing forth a certain message to mankind. And we see that changes throughout the scripture. For instance, uh, how many people are... Uh, Performing animal sacrifices today. Well, not. Well, why not? We're in a different time period, a different dispensation. Things have changed. We don't need to need to uh, perform an animal sacrifice to cover our sins or atoning our sins. Because why? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ came, paid for the sins of the world. It's done. It's all done for. So there's no reason for any more sacrifice. Hebrews 10 tells us that. No need for any more sacrifices. So we have according to the dispensation of God, which is given me to you, which is the dispensation of grace, which we are living in today, to fulfill or complete the word of God. What completed the word of God? The mystery or the revelation that was given to the Apostle Paul. Uh, and we could go to many verses for that. We don't have time to get into that right now. Which hath been hidden from ages and from generations but now is made manifest to his saints. So it was hidden to Peter at Pentecost. He knew nothing about it, absolutely nothing. Paul wasn't even saved yet. In fact, we're going to see the Apostle Paul, uh, his main vocation at this particular time was um, gathering up the believers and bringing them back to Jerusalem uh, that they might be tormented or even killed. That was what the Apostle Paul was doing. I shouldn't say the Apostle Paul. That was Saul, what Saul was doing. He wasn't Apostle Paul yet. That was what Saul was doing in the first part of Acts. We'll see that in Acts 7, the stoning of Stephen, who was the foremost person that was ahead of that uh, group that went against Stephen and stoned him. It was Saul. That was before, of course, his salvation. So there's no way that there would be any revelation of the mystery at that particular time. And uh, Paul hadn't come on the scene yet. I guess I'm done. You're right on time. Shall we bow for a word of prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the truths of your word and that we can understand the word rightly divided, understanding that uh, even the first part of Acts that is not the, the body of Christ, that it is uh, exactly what, is, uh, what was predicted clear back in the Old Testament. As Peter uh, even said that this was uh, that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel concerning the tribulation period and the thousand year reign. We thank you for these truths. We just ask now that you be with us. Open our minds to your word. Give us that desire to say in your word, to study it, that we might know you and be a better testimony for you. So this we ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.